Dragon's Dogma 1 was never finished. Around half of the game's content ended up being cut due to a lack of budget. Dragon's Dogma 2 was the director's second chance to fully realize his original creative vision with an increased budget, and he failed. Dragon's Dogma 2 repeats the original's mistakes and feels equally unfinished. Now that I've beaten Dragon's Dogma 2, I feel a bit betrayed by all the YouTubers and game critics who were so positive about it, because I thought we were all on the same page about what made the first game good. The hook of Dragon's Dogma is that you can climb on top of giant monsters to hit their weak points in epic battles. Unfortunately, the first game was rushed to release and only had around 10 bosses. The sequel's main focus should be remedying this issue, but there's still only a little over 10 bosses. And the majority of this game's bosses were from the last game. Instead, the main focus of this game is on boring fetch quests and what I now consider to be the worst main story in any RPG I've ever played. I would normally put a spoiler warning around here, but there's so little content in this game to spoil that I don't think it really matters. If you want to avoid major endgame spoilers, I'll give you a second warning later in the video, but the story is so bad I don't think it matters. Before we get into the meat of this video, I want to talk about the elephant in the room, microtransactions. Although I think the critical reception to this game is vastly overrated, the community reception has been mixed to say the least. However, it's more than just microtransactions. Blatant greed and stupidity shows up in many of the game's systems, resulting in some of the worst design decisions of any game I've ever played. I genuinely don't know how humans with working brains could have okayed any of these decisions. First of all, the game only keeps track of two save files, your last autosave and your last rest at an inn. You can also rest at a house which counts as an inn save, but if you rest at a camp and load the inn save, then it doesn't count. Now that last part isn't too bad in and of itself, except for the fact that when you load an in save, the game wipes your autosave data. What the f Capcom? <laughs> I lost an hour of progress to this, and one of the negative reviews on Steam is from a player who never slept at the inns to save money and ended up losing all of his progress in the entire game to loading an in save. The system makes me so angry, I don't even know what to say. Why does loading the last in rest wipe the autosave? And why is the manual save and autosave shared? I can save before a large enemy, then reach them, and the autosave will occur right as combat starts to lock me into the encounter. And somehow it gets worse. Every time you die and load your save, you lose a percent of your max HP, and this keeps lowering until you have below a quarter health. Even Dark Souls 2 has the decency to stop at half HP. The only way to regain max HP is to use a rest or use a revival wake stone. So you can get locked into an encounter because the autosave starts as combat begins, where every death causes you to lose max HP. My only question to Capcom is what the actual f is wrong with you. The only logical explanation I have to this is that they want to force players who get stuck to buy microtransactions. Why else do you think they're selling 5 wake stones in the shop as DLC? Now there is a workaround to this problem. Every time you die you can quit to the main menu and then load your save, and you won't lose max HP. So now every death sends you to two extremely long loading screens instead of one. Great. Capcom is literally trying to trick players who can't find this workaround into buying microtransactions and it makes me sick. Another issue with this game is performance. I played this game on an SSD on low settings which made it somewhat playable, but it was still rough. I think I crashed anywhere between 20 to 30 times. In cities, NPCs load in as you walk to them and the frame rate is inconsistent. Also, some of the side quests can get bugged if you do certain things, which is a really fun feature in a game with two save slots. Also, at launch you couldn't start a new game with a new character. All you get is your two saves and new game plus. My only explanation for this is that Capcom was trying to see if they could get away with forcing you to spend 70 more dollars to make a second character, and they'll probably change it after all of the backlash. And despite all of this blatant greed and brain-dead decisions, somehow none of this is the worst part of Dragon's Dogma 2. There's something the YouTuber Joseph Anderson once said that perfectly describes my experience with Dragon's Dogma 2. This game is a disappointment sandwich. 
The first third starts off bad enough that I wanted to quit. Then the game picks up around the halfway point when the middle starts getting good, only for the final third of the game to be a series of disappointments followed up by an abrupt ending. Right now there is a narrative being pushed that Dragon's Dogma 2 is an amazing game that is weighed down by performance issues, a terrible save system, and microtransactions, and I couldn't disagree more. Not because that stuff isn't terrible, it is terrible, but because the worst part about Dragon's Dogma 2 is the awful writing that takes center stage throughout most of the game. I heard someone once say that every NPC in Skyrim is the most boring NPC in Skyrim, and I think this applies to many things in Dragon's Dogma 2. Every character is the most boring character in Dragon's Dogma 2, every side quest is the most boring side quest, every main quest is the most boring main quest, and every cave I found while exploring was the most boring cave in the game. But I'm getting ahead of myself, we're just talking about the writing right now, and it's not good. Something I've heard the fantasy authors Brandon Sanderson and George R. R. Martin say is that it's important to make every character in a story have a unique voice based on their personality, background, and social class. In one of his lectures, Sanderson even challenged his students to try writing without tags indicating who's talking, because each of your main characters should sound distinct enough to tell them apart through dialogue alone. Dragon's Dogma 2 would thoroughly fail the Sanderson writing challenge. It doesn't matter if you're talking to nobility, knights, or a slave, they all have the same voice. There's two types of bland characters in the game. People who speak formal Old English, and kooky old people who speak formal Old English. This doesn't feel like a world with hundreds of people. It feels like I'm talking to the same character hundreds of times wearing different skins. When the chat GPT sounding spawns have more personality than most of the NPCs, that's an issue. In addition to this, every quest is so damn boring. Some critics have praised this game saying the quests are good because they don't hold your hand. And hey, I think Morrowind is Bethesda's best game. I should love the lack of hand holding. The only issue is that quests being obtuse in and of itself doesn't make them good. Most quests are just you finding an item to give to someone, delivering a letter or some item, or finding a missing person. It's as generic as generic can be. So the writing and quests are boring, but how is this more problematic than the microtransactions and save system? I said earlier that I like Morrowind, and I consider a lot of quests in that game to be very boring in their writing. So why is the writing such a large issue in Dragon's Dogma 2? Well, to explain that, I'm going to talk about Starfield again on this channel, since the quest design of both games are very similar. In Starfield, exploration sucks and the developers know it, so the vast majority of side quests you obtain in cities don't push you out to explore, but have you trapped inside of the city doing fetch quests. Some games, like The Witcher 3, can pull off interesting side quests in a city because the writing is just that good. The writing in Dragon's Dogma 2 is not good, and most quests are fetch quests which make a lot of this game feel like Starfield. The quests don't hold your hand, but that just means it's harder to find the NPCs you're looking for. This is made worse by how largely populated the cities are. If I'm asking for information, I have to talk to 10-20 to 20 people to find the 3 people with the information. Think of it like this, if side quests in Dragon's Dogma 2 were completed with a compass that tells you where to go, how many of them would just be you walking from point A to point B in a city with no challenge or gameplay? So side quests are terrible, but so what? You can just ignore them and explore. My first issue with this notion is that ignoring side quests in a fantasy game feels wrong. It's sacrilege. But even if I did skip every side quest, the required main story quests are more plentiful and more boring than the side quests. At least a small amount of the side quests send you out to explore the world. The main story is just a series of fetch quests. You go to the castle, walk around, talk to people, run back to Brant to get more quests, walk back to the castle, talk to more people, and my god are the characters boring. This is all made worse by the limited fast travel. For most of the main story quests, you are walking. You're walking and running and walking and walking and running and you never Stop, it's so absurdly boring. No combat, just running and walking. Limited fast travel does benefit open world exploration, as I'll explain later, but it's terrible for all these fetch quests. 
I mentioned at the beginning of this video that I disliked the first and last third of Dragon's Dogma 2, and this is mostly due to the many awful fetch quests I was forced to do. I think the core problem of this game's quest design is the same as Starfield's. The writers don't realize that they lack talent and skill. If most quests are fetch quests, then the only joy to be had is in the writing, and it isn't good. It's bad. Baldur's Gate 3 manages to have good side quest writing that also encourages exploration and has a good amount of combat. Dragon's Dogma 2 does none of that. The weird thing about all of this is that unlike Starfield, Dragon's Dogma 2 is actually somewhat fun to explore. If every quest was boring but sent you into the world with some loose directions on where to go then it would be a lot like Morrowind, the best Bethesda game. Instead of recapturing the magic of Morrowind, Dragon's Dogma 2 takes the Starfield route of quest design, and it suffers for it. Another issue with the bland writing is that it makes the restrictive nature of this game's world annoying rather than immersive. In Dragon's Dogma 2, you use a rare item called a Fairy Stone to fast travel, and you can also fast travel to cities with an ox cart. The main benefit of restrictive fast travel in an open world fantasy game is to immerse the player in the game world. The reason why someone might play Fallout in survival mode is to feel like a person inside of the game world, rather than a person just playing a video game. The issue is that I only want to do this if the game world is remotely interesting. I found the writing and lore of Fallout New Vegas interesting, so I wanted the hardcore mode restrictions to immerse myself in the world, where I have to scavenge for food and water. I do not find the world of Dragon's Dogma 2 at all interesting. Intrigue in a fantasy world is based off of the character's plot and world building, and Dragon's Dogma 2 fails in every domain. This is coming from a guy whose favorite genre is fantasy. I'm biased in favor of the game's setting, and I'm telling you it's not good. Furthermore, restrictions that immerse me in a world can only work if the world's logic is at least somewhat believable, and Dragon's Dogma 2 is not believable in the slightest. How are people in this world surviving at all when you take two steps away from the castle and you are attacked by the entire army of Mordor? The game also allows you to steal from people in front of them without ever getting punished. There's nothing to immerse myself in, so the fast travel restrictions just add bloat to the game's many fetch quests. There are advantages to the restricted fast travel for open world exploration, but overall it did more harm than good for my playthrough. The restrictive fast travel caused me to explore less in the early to mid game because returning to a city cost a fairy stone and I was afraid of running out. If only they sold a bundle of fairy stones as DLC, then the game would be perfect. <laughs> On the topic of exploration, let's talk about that. Before I bought Dragon's Dogma 2, I heard the YouTuber Luke Stevens compare exploration in Dragon's Dogma 2 to Elden Ring, where he said that it gave him similar feelings to Elden Ring, and he's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no opinions are wrong, every opinion is beautiful and perfect, but but this, this opinion's wrong. In Dragon's Dogma 2, the best thing you can find while exploring is one of the ten overworld bosses, which is usually a reskin, or you can find a cave with mostly one enemy type. While in Elden Ring, the absolute worst thing you can find while exploring is a reskinned boss, or a cave with a reskinned boss. And even at its worst points, Elden Ring is still better than the best parts of Dragon's Dogma Dogma 2 exploration because the boss variety and cave design is better in Elden Ring. In Elden Ring, some small dungeons were boring, but others would have creative puzzles like with the teleporting treasure chests, or they'd have interesting imp ambushes you'd have to think your way through, and every cave had a boss. In Dragon's Dogma 2, caves are linear, poorly designed, thoughtless, and usually don't have a boss. As I said earlier in the video, every cave in Dragon's Dogma 2 is the most boring cave in Dragon's Dogma 2. There were countless moments in Elden Ring where exploration was rewarded with a giant legacy dungeon or even an entire new world. In Dragon's Dogma 2, there are no real dungeons in the entire game. There's zero. There's just these little linear caves. There, there are no dungeons. Genuinely, I think there were only three unique encounters in Dragon's Dogma 2 that are even remotely worth mentioning, which were the Sphinx, 
Medusa, and Elf Village, and I dislike all of them. The Sphinx just sends you on more fetch quests before you fight her. The Elf Village just has some more side quests that I didn't bother to do because I was far enough in the game to know that these writers aren't worth giving my time. And by the time I found the only Medusa boss, it was in the endgame and I'd become too strong for her to provide any challenge. Also on the topic of Medusa, I find it extremely weird how Medusa is the first boss you fight in the tutorial and then she only shows up one more time in an endgame area. The boss variety is already terrible, and they shouldn't be hiding a boss you already fought in the tutorial. The only way Dragon's Dogma 2 exploration compares to Elden Ring is in how infinitely worse it is by comparison. A game with only 12 bosses can't compare to Elden Ring. If you ever complained about how Elden Ring reuses bosses too much but you enjoyed Dragon's Dogma 2, then I want a formal apology written to Miyazaki in Dragon's Dogma Old English Dialogue. Another thing that hurts exploration in Dragon's Dogma 2 is the awful enemy variety. I don't think I found any new normal enemies after about 5 to 8 hours of gameplay. There were goblins, saurians, bandits, wolves, harpies, and little else I can think of. This may be bad, but like with everything in Dragon's Dogma 2, it only gets worse. As I mentioned in the intro, the hook of this game is that you can climb bosses in epic battles, but there's only 12 bosses. But there aren't really 12 bosses. <laughs> the Guardian Gigantus is a late game boss who has no attacks and all you do is hit his weak points. In my opinion, this doesn't count as a boss since he can't attack and is more of a set piece. So by my definition, there's only 11 bosses. But there aren't 11 good bosses. The Cyclops is so easy that he seems more like a training dummy for new players than a good fight. I'm not saying that there shouldn't be an easy boss for new players, but I am saying that this mediocre fight takes up one of the 11 boss slots. Also, I dislike the Golem fight. It's way too simple. You hit the weak point while easily dodging his non-threatening attacks, then at low health he turns red so you run away until he freezes up, then you kill him. It's too simple. Oddly enough, the only other boss who I thought wasn't at all good was the final boss, but since that's an endgame spoiler, I won't explain why or show any footage until the spoiler section of the video. I'm so respectful. <laughs> okay, so there's 11 bosses, and I only like 8 of them. Well... Not really, <laughs> because many of these bosses are too rare for a game with only 8 fights. I straight up didn't find the Sphinx, so I can't comment on that fight, and I only found Medusa when I was so strong that I barely saw her moveset. I also only found the white once at random on the road after a dragon also came down to attack me. Although it would have been fun to fight the white and the dragon at the same time, I couldn't do it because the game disables your autosave in the endgame and I didn't want to lose progress. Which is a whole different issue that I'll explain later, but all you need to know right now is real brain damage went into this game's design. In other words, when it comes to every rare boss encounter, whether I found them or not, I didn't have an enjoyable experience with any of them. Okay, so the game doesn't actually have 8 enjoyable bosses. It has 5. F***ing 5. And even if I loved the Sphinx and White bosses that I didn't do, if I fought these two bosses once in a 30-40 to 40 hour RPG, that wouldn't make my opinion any more positive. The five enjoyable bosses that aren't extremely rare are the Ogre, Minotaur, Chimera, Griffin, and Lesser Dragon. Most of these bosses have variants which have the exact same movesets but with some stat differences. If there are any differences in these boss movesets, they aren't impactful enough for me to have noticed. Of these five bosses that I enjoyed fighting, only the Minotaur is new to this game, the rest were in the original Dragon's Dogma 1. After around 15 to 20 hours, I had killed my first griffin and my first dragon, and I thoroughly enjoyed those fights. I was looking forward to seeing what new fun fights would await me in the end game. Unfortunately, there is no end game, just reskinned bosses and fetch quests. So the enemy and boss variety is terrible in a game all about combat with bad writing. 
Unfortunately, I'm not done complaining about the combat because there's still more wrong with this game. In more ways than one, the combat balancing is bad. Firstly, some skills like the Thief's Sonic Ball of Death are way too strong. The Thief's Ball of Death gives you a jump so you can easily hit many enemy weak points like their heads with tons of damage, and you don't have to waste time climbing. Realistically, a lot of the time I was climbing the enemies and hitting their weak points, it was just because it was fun, not because it was efficient. This game becomes absurdly easy around the late mid game. I say late mid game and not end game because there isn't enough content for me to consider this game to have an end game. Basically, you become so strong that the only thing that can kill you is a lesser dragon because of their one shot meteor attacks. This game doesn't have a hard mode, so there's no way to increase difficulty. There is a new game plus that I won't bother to play, but I've heard that it doesn't seem to increase enemy difficulty in a meaningful way to challenge your mid-game level and equipment, which I also heard was a problem in the original Dragon's Dogma. Also, Dragon's Dogma 2 has unlimited pause menu healing, like in the first game. This is bad for an action combat game and turns it into more of a stats game. Wow, with this many complaints, it must seem like I really hate Dragon's Dogma 2 or something. And I, I think I do hate it. <laughs> but that's not to say there isn't anything special in this game. Many beloved games are either mediocre and bad in almost every area, but exceptional in one facet, which is enough for people to love it and for a community to be made. Dragon's Dogma 2 is precisely one of those games that does one thing exceptionally well while scuffing everything else. At first I thought the thing I enjoyed about this game was obvious, its combat against giant bosses in the early to mid game before you get too overpowered. And yeah, that is fun, but it isn't actually the true strength of Dragon's Dogma 2. When it comes to combat mechanics, this is all pretty run of the mill stuff. The most mechanically complex boss in the game is the Lesser Dragon, and even then he's really only as complicated as a Dark Souls 1 boss with big explosion attacks you have to run away from and some simple claw swipes and ground pounds that you have to run away from. Even the five bosses that I liked aren't going to blow your mind away with their mechanics, but despite that, there's still something Dragon's Dogma 2 does exceptionally well unlike any other game I've ever played. The systems in Dragon's Dogma Dogma 2 are amazing at telling stories through gameplay, which is especially good since the developers can't tell a story with writing to save their lives. Let me give you an example of what I mean, which is also where Dragon's Dogma 2 clicked for me. Around 13 hours in, I was exploring the desert to reach the city of Batal, and Griffin came down to attack me. I'd seen Griffins before this point and they'd always kick my ass, so I was a little scared, but I stood my ground and fought. Eventually the griffin flew away, but then a few hours later he came back and I realized that he was still missing health from our first fight. For the next several hours the griffin would interrupt my fights to torment me, and I'd slowly whittle down his health. After about an in-game week, I had almost reached my destination of Batal, and the griffin knew he had one last chance to best me. He flew down for another battle, and this time he wouldn't be running away. I had a long, epic battle where the griffin murdered all of my pawns multiple times only for me to revive them and keep the fight going. After over 10 minutes of straight battle, I jumped onto the creature's back and lit him on fire with my flaming dagger attack so I could stick my blade through his skull in one final blow. Although we were victorious, the battle went on for so long it had become nighttime, meaning that ghosts were wandering about, and our max HP had lowered from taking so much damage during the fight. The only way for me and all my pawns to heal max HP is to rest at a camp, so I set out to find the nearest campsite in the dark, only to be attacked by a horde of goblins while we were still weak. So did we give up and run away? Of course not. We stood our ground and we fought. I killed every last one of them, and after the chaos had ended I looked around to see that the pawn I had journeyed with for the longest had died. Claire Cross had been killed in the attack. A terrible tragedy. I made it to the camp and killed the griffin. But at what cost? Although I think there's more negatives than positives to how fast travel works, I will admit that if you could fast travel with no cost, it would lessen the feeling of desperation felt when you're caught in a bad situation while exploring the open world, and that would cheapen the story that the gameplay tells. 
Of course, I'd also say that pause menu healing and wake stones also cheapen the story that the gameplay tells because you can just live forever if you feel like it. I'd be on board with the limited fast travel system if more of the game was just exploration and combat and less of the game was boring fetch quests. I also wish there were more flying enemies like the griffin that could escape and re-enter battle because it results in the most fun stories. Dragons can fly, but they don't ever try to escape or come back. Another story worth sharing was the time the game autosave locked me into a fight against a lesser dragon when I was underleveled. Now it is annoying that the game has a terrible save system, but did I run away? Come on, you, you already know the answer to that. I spent the next hour trying to murder the thing for fun, okay? And it was fun. I developed a strategy where I'd order my pawns to run away from the dragon when he'd summon his meteor one-shot attacks so it'd be easier to revive them. After spending 17 minutes on a single attempt, I landed on the dragon's head with my spin attack, and I used the opportunity to grab onto him and hit his weak point, only for him to start summoning his magical one-shot attack again. And I, he was going to kill me. It was going to be over all of the time that I invested. But I was tired of running. I spammed my highest stamina attack, and I ripped out the dragon's brain before he could send us all to our early graves. This story is cheapened by the fact that I could have just used a wake stone if I died, so yeah, healing does kind of ruin the thrill if you think about it, but it's still a fun memory. If I'm being honest, these stories of my encounters with giant bosses in the early to mid game are the only parts of Dragon's Dogma 2 that I thoroughly enjoyed, and although they were short-lived, they did leave a real lasting impact on me. By the end game, these stories can't happen because you're too strong for the enemies to be able to kill you or be a threat. And if the giant evil monster isn't a threat and you just look at them like a normal enemy, then there is no exciting story because conflict is necessary for the story to be exciting. To make this video reflect my experience with Dragon's Dogma 2, I decided to structure it just like the game. I start off negative. Then I get a little positive, it really seems like maybe it's turning around. And now we're gonna go full on into the negative, because all we have left to talk about is the main story and the ending, and yeah, it's gonna get bad, guys. <laughs> Typically, I try to understand and analyze stories in depth to see if they have any large problems like plot holes. I did this with God of War Ragnarok, and there was a lot of problems and plot holes and disappointments in that game. I even paid enough attention to Starfield's terrible main story to talk about the game's plot holes. But I'm not gonna do that here. It was so boring that I can't be bothered to analyze it. Instead, I'm just gonna make fun of it. <laughs> It's meaningless politics and fantasy drivel delivered through a ton of fetch quests. I'm certain the story would have had a ton of plot holes if I analyzed it, but it's so boring it's not worth understanding. So instead of an in-depth analysis, here's a brief summary to get to the ending. The game starts with a cutscene where the Kingsguard Brant introduces a person who isn't shown as the new king of Vermund. After this, the real game starts and you're a slave. The slave camp gets attacked by monsters, you run away, and a ghost man sends a griffin to save you and you fly away on it. You get back to the castle, talk to Brant, and as it turns out, your character has amnesia and has forgotten that he is the chosen one. Of course you are. During a battle with the true dragon, before the game started, he stole your heart and marked you as the Arisen. Now you have to seek out the true dragon and reclaim your heart. The Arisen alone has the power to control pawns, which are the magical companions who accompany you in every fight. The Arisen is always crowned king of the land, but the queen doesn't want to lose power so she finds some criminal and gives him an amulet that lets him control pawns. Since only the Arisen should be able to control pawns, this makes people think that he's the chosen one and not you, so you can't claim your throne. After this, I'm gonna be honest, I tuned out. You do a shit ton of fetch quests in the castle, and then you do more fetch quests in Batal. The story is extremely awkwardly designed with almost no combat and really nothing of interest. You literally spend hours doing nothing. There is no midpoint climax or cool story boss battle or even one dungeon in the entire game. It was around here writing this script that I realized overall this is the worst main story of any RPG I've ever played. Before that title went to Starfield, and while overall Dragon's Dogma 2 is a better game than Starfield because I like the combat more, I think Starfield has a better story. <laughs> oh, people are gonna really get upset over that hot take. 
I somewhat liked a few story missions in Starfield. Not most of them, but a couple. One such mission was when you visit Neon and get attacked by some rich asshole, then you escape the planet with the artifact, only to get attacked by the mysterious Starborn spaceship. Even Starfield managed to have this quest as a midpoint climax. Meanwhile, Dragon's Dogma 2 is just awful. I don't even have much memory of what happened, it's like I repressed the experience. Oh yeah, I remember one part. You do something and this epic looking underwater castle arises from the ocean. That was so cool. I thought it would be like a medieval Bioshock dungeon where you explore a castle and look out the windows and see some fish and maybe there's a few traps and a boss and some enemies. That would be epic. Instead, you go through a linear cave that you already went through earlier in the main story that has a new passageway open up that sends you through more of a linear cave until you get straight into the heart of the castle, and then you talk to a ghost and he gives you a sword. That's it. That, that is the biggest tease in any game I've played. Underwater dungeon, there's nothing. It's just straight linear path and some saurians. This game is a joke. On the topic of disappointing dungeons, there is nothing that I'd consider to be a dungeon in Dragon's Dogma 2. There's linear caves with one enemy type and that's it. The world design is okay and sometimes creative, but the level design is some of the worst I've ever seen. It might be worse than Starfield, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <I don't... laughs> in Elden Ring, you have these sprawling legacy dungeons where you explore entire cities with multiple optional and required bosses. That never happens in this game once. Part of the reason why this main story is so terrible is because not only is it terribly written, but the gameplay side of it is non-existent. Welp, now that we're getting to the end of the story, here's your second spoiler warning. But I will say that if you were enjoying this video and you leave now just to avoid spoilers, then you probably care about this game's story more than the writers do. Anyways, after you get the sword from the ghost in the underwater castle, you bring it to this wizard looking guy and he tells you it doesn't have enough power. So you kill some dragons and use their scales to power up the sword. This sword allows you to open a door to reach the last section of the map. I have no idea why you need this sword to open the door because I didn't pay attention. After walking through the door, the guardian gigantis attacks and you do a set piece boss battle thingy. While you fight the boss, the false arisen and the wizard guy run ahead into a tower. You beat the boss and proceed to the final slave camp from the beginning of the game. The game encourages you to rest at the inn in the camp before running up the tower so that you can heal, and for some reason the wizard is still waiting for you like no time has passed. The mean wizard man plays with his staff. <laughs> the mean wizard man plays with his staff while you fight some guards. The false arisen isn't here anymore, I don't know why, he just disappears. Maybe he was killed by the evil wizard. I don't care to check because ultimately none of the castle politics or any characters matter at all. The only exceptions is the dragon, the ghost, and maybe the wizard man. Everything else is just fluff. Anyways, the wizard casts a spell to stop the dragon or something, and it doesn't work, so the dragon comes down anyways, and he's holding whatever character you did the most quests for, which for me was the Prince Fen. You can either run away and let the character die, or fight the dragon, which is such a stupid non-choice, because of course everyone's going to fight. But whatever, you climb up the dragon's back and he flies you to your final battleground. It's this moment where probably the first thing in the story that I enjoyed happens. You walk around the dragon's back as he flies around the overworld, which is kind of a pretty sight, and he talks about how you're both stuck in a meaningless cycle of life and death, and how it's impossible to truly change the world. I still think the story is meaningless drivel, but this dragon is cool as hell. I love the voice actor, he really sells it with a great performance. I kinda wish this dragon was inside of my character's head the whole game, or maybe he could've shown up a few more times. Because honestly, this dragon is the only character I like. I never beat the first Dragon's Dogma, but if there's more of this dragon, then automatically it has a better main story. I don't care about anything else. Once you get to your arena, you guys do battle, and as I stated earlier, this boss is one of the worst ones in the game. He's too big to reliably hit his head when you're on the ground, so you have to climb him, and then he has no shake-off attacks or attacks of any kind when you're on his head, so you just kind of stay there as long as you like until you run out of stamina, or if you're like me, use items in the pause menu to stay up there to finish the boring boss quicker. 
It's more of a set piece than a boss, and honestly, you can kind of knock the boss count down on this one, and I don't even know if this counts. Also, if the dragon could shake you off, it would still suck because he's too big and takes too long to climb. To fix the fight, they should increase climbing movement speed in this battle only, then have him attack you with spells while you're on top of his back so that you have to run away from him in between attacks. I heard this fight has multiple phases in the original Dragon's Dogma and was better, but I don't know, never beat that game. Either way, you easily murder the dragon and return to Vermund as its rightful ruler, and the game ends the way it began, with Brant introducing you as its king. What poetry, ending like the beginning. But wait, there's more. The ghost man who saved you in the slave camp is sitting at a table, and if you talk to him twice, he sends you back in time to refight the dragon somehow. I refought this boring boss three times to figure out what to do, and then looked it up on the internet. You're supposed to use the sword that opened the door earlier to kill yourself. Of course, that's obvious, why wouldn't I think of that? <laughs> After doing this, you fall into the ocean and get swallowed up by some tentacles. These Japanese people and their weird fetishes, am I right guys? When you wake up, all the water in the world has drained and a month has passed. How people have been surviving without water all this time, I have no idea. The sky is red and the world has changed into some sort of hellscape. This is called the Unmoored World. The world changing like this is the second and the last cool moment in the entire story. It was so cool that it tricked me into thinking that there might be some new interesting content in the changed world. Immediately I went to explore where the oceans used to be, and you know what I found? You already know what I found, it was more reskinned enemies copy pasted. This place reminds me of Demon Ruins from Dark Souls 1, you know, one of the worst levels in the Dark Souls series. Uninspired, reskinned boss spam. <sighs> and so after killing a few bosses I already killed like f***ing 10-15 times, I went to Batal and saw a red beacon. I interacted with it and was forced to follow the mean wizard man from earlier who is now less mean, and the game forced me to fight more reskinned enemies that I'd already been fighting since the beginning of the game as I ran through a city that I've already run through dozens of times. Near the end of this boredom, I got hit by a Saurian, and despite having around 80% of my health, I died. <laughs> I didn't want to waste a wake stone since, you know, I just saved a little bit ago. And guess what happened? The game deleted my save and only let me start from the very beginning of the unmoored world before I killed any of the bosses. F*** you, Capcom. Like, who, who like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Once you enter the unmoored world hellscape, they delete your autosave whenever you die, and only let you start when you last woke up from a bed, or from the very beginning of the unmoored world. I doubt any of the Japanese developers are watching this, but if they are, I have a question. Who hurt you? What's wrong with you? Why would you delete autosaves that used to work upon death? Why wouldn't you at least notify the player that that would happen? I'm past the point of anger, now I'm confused. Like I know how to program, it's pretty hard to code and requires a certain level of intelligence, so I know at least some people who don't have severe brain damage were involved in making this game. So how could a human with a working brain design this? Oh wait, no, I just figured it out while writing this script. The only way to not lose your progress is to use a wake stone when you die. So they delete your autosave so that you'll buy microtransactions. That's the only reason I can think that they would do this. Anyways, after restarting from the beginning of this hellscape, I did the main story and went back to the underwater castle from earlier that is no longer underwater. For some reason, I'm still an idiot, and for, I thought there'd be like a dungeon or like a boss or something, you know, maybe like, maybe I'd have fun again. You're not having fun again once you enter the unmoored world. The game stopped being fun like 10 hours ago. If you think you were gonna have fun, you're, you're a f***ing idiot. There's no fun to be had. Instead, you know what you find? An NPC who talks to you with bad dialogue and tells you that the world's ending so you need to convince the world leaders to gather at this castle so that they don't die. You know what that means. We're gonna end this story off with a bang. More f***ing fetch quests. Oh my god. <laughs> A lot of people gave this game like a 9 out of 10. Right now the critic score on Metacritic is 87, okay? Like, this this is not an 87. This is not what an 87 is. Like, if this is an 87, then I don't like video games. <laughs> okay. 
So you do several more hours of fetch quests while avoiding all combat, which is the only part of the game I like. Because if you do combat, then your autosave gets deleted and you lose all progress until the last time you rested. And you can't just spam your rests, because if you rest too many times, the world will end <laughs> and everyone dies. <laughs> There's no way I would have beaten this game if I wasn't making a YouTube video. I'm, I'm doing this for you guys, okay? I'm not doing this for me. <laughs> so you do a bunch of fetch quests running around cities and convince the people of Vermund, Batal, and the elves to seek refuge in a ruined castle. Remember when I said that this game basically doesn't have an end game? Well, I sort of lied. It, this is the end game. After many hours of boredom, I got all the world leaders to come to the castle, and then I spammed my sleep and wasted the rest of the days until a red beacon formed in the ruined castle camp for me to interact with, and I was able to finish the game. And still, still I was hopeful. I thought, maybe, they're saving the only dungeon in the game for the end. I don't know why I thought that. <laughs> I thought there might be a dungeon. They're, they're, they're saving it for the end, guys. The, there, there'll be one dungeon. And, and I thought, okay, pro there probably won't be a dungeon, right? I don't need to get my hopes up. But, like, <laughs> maybe a boss. <laughs> maybe there'll be a boss. Like, I, I was thinking maybe, maybe there'll be some underworld dungeon, like, when I got by those tentacle monsters, where we're gonna fight some Cthulhu-like monster. Get the f*** out of here. There, there's, there's, no, there's none of that. There's no, you, you don't have joy when playing this game past like the 20, 25 hour mark. There's none of that. It's a cutscene. It's a long cutscene. The true ending, all the fetch quests, you do it to do a long cutscene, all right? Like, are, are you watching this YouTube video? That's what it is. That's the ending of the game. You walk on the dragon's back again and you watch a cutscene. There is no final boss for the true ending. In this cutscene, you stab the dragon's heart, and the ghost man from earlier maybe dies, I think. During the credits, new cutscenes play, which seem to say that you broke the cycle of the dragon and saved everyone, and now the oceans are back, and people can drink water, but I guess they never needed water anyways, because they lived a month without water. Like, I don't know. Ugh. My interpretation of the ending is that usually the Arisen either becomes a dragon or a god of the new world, or at least when I looked it up, that's what people said the ending of Dragon's Dogma 1 was. But I think here I broke the cycle by killing myself twice, and now I'm dead, the ghost man's dead, and the dragon's dead, like the three people in the cycle. Pretty sure the ghost man was a god, don't really know, I don't think they really explain it. If they did, I tuned it out, but now we're all dead. So here's some questions. Why didn't I die the first time I stabbed myself? Why did stabbing the dragon at the end break the cycle if killing him before continued the cycle? It's like violence is the answer either way, why is it a different outcome? Honestly, I don't know, and I don't really think I care. This is the worst main story of any RPG I've ever played. Starfield was better. The only fun I had in this game was when I ignored the main story and side quests and just explored and fought monsters. Unironically, my favorite part of the ending was when my game crashed during the end credits. I could not stop laughing, it was so funny. This game is so intensive, so advanced, so next generation, that even the credit slide can crash. That is a perfect ending to Dragon's Dogma 2. And of course it didn't save my progress and I had to redo it. Of course it did, right? Like, because the save system doesn't work. Why would it? Why would the save system work when the game crashes constantly? Oh my god. <laughs> when the game crashes in the ending credits, I don't think it's my computer is the problem. Alright, so closing thoughts on Dragon's Dogma 2. I'm angry. I'm livid. Honestly, recording this script, I just think it's funny how bad it is. But I'm also angry. I'm angry that they tried to trick players into buying microtransactions in a $70 game. I'm a little angry that brain damage went into the save system. I'm also a little angry that so many YouTubers hype this game up, but it's just a disappointment. But more than anything, what makes me the most angry is that a game with so much potential is this bad. As I explained in the middle of the video, some parts in the middle of Dragon's Dogma 2 gave me a fun, unique experience unlike any other game I've ever played. 
The stories that you create from some monster fights and exploration can be really cool. I might recommend this game to an action RPG enthusiast on a steep discount to experience the cool overworld bosses, but I'd recommend skipping the boring side quests and the awful true ending. In fact, don't even beat it, just you know, fight some lesser dragons, fight the griffins, fight the bosses, and just, just stop, it's not worth it. Or just kill the true dragon and then just end the game. I think the reason why this game is so bad is because of bad priorities. I think most of this game's budget was spent on making good graphics, character models, and the giant cities, when it should have been spent on the best part of the game, which are the boss monsters and the stories you make with them. A ton of the game is devoted to the terrible writing, just to pad out its length. I'm going to propose how Dragon's Dogma 3 could change to highlight this game's strengths while covering up its weaknesses. It may seem stupid for a YouTuber to think he can do better than actual game developers, and maybe I am stupid, but this is so bad I really think I could do better if I had a team of hundreds working on a game for five years. Firstly, they need to take out all of those boring fetch quests and have quest design more like Morrowind that's about using loose directions to find objectives in the open world. Even if you get lost, you'll get lost while exploring, and just like with Morrowind, that can be part of the fun. Next, there needs to be more normal enemies and they need to be more aggressive. And even more importantly than that, there needs to be way more bosses. For most of this game, you're fighting the same seven overworld bosses over and over again, and I only like five of them. There should be at least 20, maybe 30 overworld bosses. And even then it wouldn't compare to Elden Ring, that's the funny part. <laughs> the world should have actual dungeons, especially in the main story. They should spend some time actually making some interconnected levels instead of these crappy linear caves. They shouldn't spend so much time making cities. The cities are bloated, bad for performance, and all the NPCs are boring. They should only have one city as a hub in a ruined world where you kill monsters and explore the ruins. And for performance, they should probably have an option to reduce the amount of useless NPCs in the city. That would be nice. They need to do something differently with enemy scaling to make the endgame not so easy. More than this, a ton of the damage balancing for the skills just needs to be fine-tuned. I'd also like a potential sequel to have multiplayer, especially if it's focused on combat instead of the crappy writing. But that might be beyond these developers' ability if this is all they can do after 5 years and 2 game releases. Lastly, let's talk about the main story. If you had good writers, you can make an engaging story and make something like The Witcher 3 or Baldur's Gate 3. But with the terrible writing of this game, you'd be better off copying Dark Souls and just making the players have to kill a few required bosses in different dungeons on the map to open a door that leads to the end. I know it's beyond generic to just kind of rip off what Dark Souls has been doing for many years, but at least a simple story wouldn't get in the way of the fun combat against giant enemies. It wouldn't be a negative, it would be like a neutral. The way I see it right now, the Dragon's Dogma community is in the same place that they were when the game first released. This is a cool idea for a game that has potential, but it's unfinished. And unpolished. If the first game had half its content cut and this was the developer's chance for redemption, well frankly, I'm embarrassed for them. This game is so similar to the original that it's more like a remake, but it has all of the original's same problems. This would be the equivalent to From Software doing a full remake of Dark Souls 1 where they leave Lost Isolith and Demon Ruins untouched. If reception to this video is anything like the Zelda video, there will be a bunch of people telling me I'm grifting for views and that all my opinions are fake. And hey, if you think I'm grifting and that it's impossible for people to disagree with your objectively correct opinion that Dragon's Dogma 2 is a masterpiece, just think about how alienating it is to be me and play such a disappointing bad game that so many other people have hyped up beyond belief. However, I will say that I've been too negative on this channel, especially recently. It's not really a part of any intentional narrative or strategy, I just think that every major game release I've played in the last year has been bad, except for Baldur's Gate 3 which is one of the greatest games of all time. I regret getting so addicted to Baldur's Gate 3 that I rushed the video out so that I could start on the Starfield video sooner because that was my last opportunity to make a mostly positive video. And in the video, I talked about all my negatives, but I did not at all talk about all the positives of that game, which are many. 
One thing that annoys me about both gamers and critics is that I feel like they have amnesia. A game with exceptional exploration and enemy variety like Elden Ring or Baldur's Gate 3 will come out and be a 10 out of 10. Everyone's playing it. Then a game with chat GPT copy-pasted exploration and terrible enemy variety like Tears of the Kingdom or Dragon's Dogma 2 will release, and a ton of people will praise it anyways. And although opinions are subjective, Something like enemy variety is an objective numeric value. The quality of the enemies is subjective, but the amount is objective. So I don't know how so many people can't understand why the game with hundreds of enemies and bosses like Elden Ring is better than the game with 12 bosses and like 5 enemy types. If you hate every boss in Elden Ring, then maybe you disagree based on that, but if you like most of the bosses in both games, then objectively Elden Ring is better. Same with exploration. What's better? The game that has large legacy dungeons like Elden Ring, or a game with tiny micro-penis dungeons like Tears of the Kingdom, or a game with no dungeons! Think, just, just think about it. <laughs> All I'm trying to say at this point is please guys, just think a little bit more before you call me a grifter. I don't think I should be a contrarian. I genuinely think that people are either lying to themselves or intentionally to get review codes, or they're just unable to compare objective measurements between games. Again, the opinion is subjective, but numerical measurements on the amount of content is objective data, and when so many opinions spit in the face of the data, I just get confused at how I'm the odd one out. And also, if I was a critic for a different industry, like the music industry or film, I wouldn't even be an odd one out. It's just games where people are so positive, probably because you kind of got to get review codes to be a part of the main players in this industry. That's how it is, so that's why they do it. The point of what I'm trying to say is don't f***ing say Dragon's Dogma 2 is like Elden Ring. It's not. It's objectively less than Elden Ring. And in my subjective opinion, it's a hell of a lot worse than Elden Ring. Dragon's Dogma 2 is pretty bad. Elden Ring is a masterpiece. And as a concluding statement to this video, let's all be excited that we're going to get more Elden Ring when the DLC comes out in a few months. So, you know, that's one way to end it on a positive. So the video was supposed to end just there, but I'm still talking because I got some things wrong in the video and I want to add on to some points that I made earlier. To correct a mistake made in the video, there aren't 12 bosses, there's more like 14, or 15, or 16, maybe, I don't know. Now that I've been doing YouTube for a while, I try to do more research before uploading a video, but Dragon's Dogma 2 has some bosses that are so hidden they weren't mentioned in any of the boss guides I looked over a week after the game's launch when I wrote the script. One boss only appears at night in specific locations and I rarely explored at night, and two are found in the unmoored world which I also barely explored because it would delete my autosave upon death, so of course I didn't explore. It's unclear to me if one of the unmoored world bosses, the Dragon Purgener, is different enough from lesser dragons to be considered a fully unique 15th boss, but the Worm Purgener boss is a completely unique endgame boss. I also found a reddit post that talked about a nighttime boss called the Skeleton Lords, but this looks to be less of a boss and more of a strong small enemy type, so I don't think it counts as a 16th boss, but I could be wrong because I never had an experience fighting him. The fact that a game where you fight 7 bosses the entire time, 6 of which are reskinned from the original Dragon's Dogma, is hiding anywhere between 5 to 7 unique encounters so well that neither me nor the guides I used found 4 of them makes me so unbelievably angry and dumbfounded, I don't even know what to say. You have to earn the right to hide bosses by having good enemy variety. You can't be avant-garde like Dark Souls and hide content in secret areas when you've barely made any content to begin with. On the topic of exploration, I think most of it's mediocre due to the bad dungeons and enemy variety, but if you found more hidden bosses than me, you might think it's a tad bit better than is represented in this video. Still not even 10% as amazing as Elden Ring, but a bit better. 
To expand upon an idea I brought up earlier, I think the main reason why gamers and game critics are so obnoxiously positive is because gamers spend so much time and money on games that they want to block out all criticism since they're too deeply invested. Consumers spend next to nothing on music, so it's not a big deal when someone trashes an album. But you spend a lot of time and money on games, so it hurts more when someone trashes the thing you've hyped up in your mind for years. To finally end this video, I want to clarify my stance on what my actual opinion of Dragon's Dogma 2 is, partially because it changed a lot while playing the game. During the middle of the game, I quite liked it, I thought it was a good game held back by a lot of stupidity, and by the end of the game, I was seething with anger. <laughs> so I'm going to commit the cardinal sin of long-form video game essays and actually write the game. The way I see it, this game's combat has potential, but is held back mostly by terrible enemy variety and boring main and side quests. Overall, I'd give it a 5 out of 10 that rises to a 6 if you ignore the boring side quests. But I can't really give it that rating because the game only has two saves, and the game autosave locks me into combat, and loading in rests elite my autosave, and loading a save lowers max HP unless you sit through two loading screens, and they try to trick you into buying microtransactions by lowering your max HP, and you can't start a new character file upon release, and the final boss sucks, and dying in the unmoored world deletes my autosave, and the end game is just fetch quests with no combat, and most of the early game is fetch quests with no combat, and I didn't like a single main story quest in the entire game, I at least liked a few quests from Starfield, not most of them, but a couple, there were zero I liked in this game, and after you do all of the fetch quests in the unmoored world, there's no final boss for the true ending, and there's probably more bullshit that I could add on right here that I can't think of right now. The point is, so much of this game is brain dead, it's mind boggling. So I'm gonna lock this game at a very generous four out of 10. I'm giving it above a three because I liked some of the memorable stories that combat created, but every decision in this game feels handcrafted to piss me off. If they change some of the easier to fix issues with the save system and whatnot, Maybe the game can rise to a 5 or a 6, but it is not that right now. I will say one more thing as a final, final closing statement to this video. The feeling I felt most while playing Dragon's Dogma 2 was boredom, while the feeling I felt most while writing and thinking about Dragon's Dogma 2 was pure rage.